Welcome to Living in Color. I'm your host Farah Nasser and today we're talking about internalized racism, what it is, how someone can learn self-hate for their own racial community, and we're going to ask our guests how they think internalized racism could be unlearned. Today I'm joined by University of Toronto professor Garish Daswani and Galek Badesang, who is a writer and communications professional. Both of you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Let's get right into this because this is a, an interesting notion that I think a lot of people might not understand. Garish, I'll start it with you. What is internalized racism? Well, for me, internalized racism is when uh, people, when we internalize the derogatory categories and ideas about race that um, some people hold and create as forms of a knowledge um, that seem to be real, but are not real. They're actually constructed. But although they're constructed, they have become real over many, many years, including through colonialism. Okay. Let's talk about how this affects the individual and also the community. Like, talk about your personal community as well. Well, so for me, internalized racism, and just uh, echoing what Grish just talked about, is... Um, is a way in terms of like defining your own kind of being and then measuring yourself constantly against mm. how you stack up, right? In the context of Canada, for instance. So when I, I came in Canada uh, at the turn of 2000, uh, 15, 16 years old, um, and I came here as an immigrant, as a refugee. Um, but, and so these notions of white supremacy and, um, you know, settler colonialism and all of those notions were very, like, I wasn't aware of them at all, but I could, it, like, very kind of subtly take these cues from the dominant cultures around me. Um, so even if it meant something like, you know, uh, during lunch hour, not wanting to sit with people who are recently arrived, you know, f associating them as somehow a little less ideal, mm. you know, trying to get rid of my accent or being conscious of it, um, not wanting to wear traditional clothes, you know, not wanting to bring your own food, you know, things like that. I think those are all like different ways in which we, you know, try to assimilate and integrate into the society around us, whatever that means. And then taking it beyond, like you said, to the larger community, um, you know, I think, especially when it comes to notions of anti-blackness, um, Islamophobia, homophobia, all these different prejudices that get played out um, are definitely reproduced within our communities, uh, but we don't talk about them enough. How and why do you think it happens, internalized racism? I mean, how does it, how does it come to be, in your opinion? I will say, and not as an excuse, but just as a way of informing myself, like a desire to belong mm. and a desire to somehow, you know, climb the rungs of society in some ways. And if that means trying to diminish certain aspects of myself or trying to diminish aspects that I don't think are uh, ideal in myself or in others, I think that's how it first steps in, this, this need to want to belong. Um, and then, but we're not really sure what that means. And so we're grasping. When we look at generations ago, and I mean, you study, you study human and human behavior. I mean, yeah. there has always been a need to belong. Has Absolutely. there always been this type of kind of grouping? Is one group being more superior? Are people thinking that? Well, I mean, there, there always have been some kinds of classification of how we are separate from each other in some way. So the idea of, of group belonging or group think is there. But then at the same time, race is a more recent construction mm. and internalized racism is actually so sub subconscious and so it happens so um, unconsciously that that um, we it actually affects us in ways that we don't actually realize. So the impact of uh, of uh, unconscious racism or internalized racism mm -hmm. has long lasting effects in people in the way that they see themselves according to the values that have been prescribed by a dominant culture or a dominant group. So it's not just about whiteness, it could, the dominant group could be a non-white group um, who set the values in terms of all the, all the conditions in which one would be valued more than the other. What are some of the examples that you speak of when, you, when you're talking about kind of almost self-hate and, and things that people might do or, or might not realize that they're doing or thinking? Well, I mean, you think about how um, standards of uh, beauty and uh, mm. skin whitening creams in South Asia in Africa. So I work in Ghana. Um, I'm of South Asian background. I grew up in Singapore. And in all these places, you find that um, the shades of one's brownness, the shades of one's blackness, the shades of one's skin matter. At the same time, uh, you have skin whitening creams and ideas of, fa of fairness, which are standards of so-called beauty, of which without you cannot 
afford to be called beautiful or get a good job or get married and so on. You have the ideas of beauty which apply to places in Africa and South Asia and Southeast Asia where whiteness is seen to be the highest standard of beauty. I, to both of you, do you think this is, this is more dangerous or worse or as bad as just regular racism, this internal racism? I mean, how does it compare? Within this whole conversation, the, for me, the, again, the larger picture is, again, the dominant ideologies and the, and the inequities that we have, right? Which is about white supremacy, which is settler colonial violence and all of those things. So for me, it's a way to always center those um, and then figuring out how I am situated in that power inequity. Every time, like, I have to question myself and, you know, question my privileges, right? Yes, I came here as a refugee, as a Tibetan refugee, as a direct result of the occupation of my homeland. But at the same time, I'm also straight, I'm cisgendered, I'm uh, able-bodied, neurotypical, I came up in a pretty middle-class upbringing, you know, I don't have a bad form of accent, right? These are all things that I have to be constantly aware of so that in, in doing so, I hope I can have a clearer view of my standing in, in, in this society. And so to your question about whether internalized racism is worse than regular racism, um, I think it's a dance, right? And I, and I think uh, obviously, you know, the, the, the white supremacy and how it functions and who it up, whose, whose powers it upholds and everything is, is pa paramount. But we have to also understand how we are complicit in that. We, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, closing the door to those behind us, right? Or, or a, you know, back in the day in the times of slavery, somebody who worked in the house ratting out somebody who was working in the fields, oh. like, you know, that kind of thing to, to make sure that they're at a point of privilege. How does that stack up? I think they work hand in hand. Like, like, like you, you said very well, it's, it's a dance. I think the internalized racism is harder to get to, though, because it's not something that the person, the individual, can see. I have a friend who has a PhD and who is very intelligent and is, uh, you know, in a very high position. She's black. She grew up in a white part of Canada, so all her friends were white. All her, um, all the institutions in which she went to school were dominated by white people. She only recently came to the realization that she had unconscious bias against black people. Now, this is at a very much later stage in her, in her life. And as someone who is very highly educated and who has uh, achieved a lot in their life, how do, you, how do you get a grip of that? How do you deal with that personally when you realize that even though you self-identify as black, that you've unconsciously held biases against black people? And that's not uncommon. There's a movie coming out called, I think, I believe it's called Farming. It's about a Nigerian boy who's farmed out by his family to the UK and brought up by working class white British people. He grew up but to be the leader of a neo-Nazi gang. So he hated non-white people by, by, by the time he joined this gang. Um, that's this because is a documentary? It's a real, uh, it's a movie based on a oh, okay. real life like a experience. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. And the director is the actual person who went wow. through this. Um, and these, like, these cases might seem far and few between, but they're not. They're actually, to a different minute degree, we all have internalized certain assumptions about ourselves based upon the color of our skin, which we feel is a problem in some way, and it's not. Let me ask you, though, I, I want to pick up on a point that you said. Can we unlearn this behavior? Can we uh, change ourselves to expose our own unconscious bias, but also unlearn this internalized form of racism? Gersh? Of course we can. How? Um, we have to come to the realization first that we hold unconscious bias, but not just use it as a way to then carry on as, as if life was like it was before. We have to also unlearn it in a way that is very uncomfortable. It's not going to be a comfortable experience. It forces you to see that um, not only that you're not perfect, but that you've actually been hating on and hating people who um, look like you or who are like you for the very fact that you see yourself as being better than them based upon the standards of others who have always viewed you as being inferior, um, we start to um, read about it. There's an unconscious bias test online that uh, you can take, and it just shows you whether or not you have, how much unconscious bias you have towards people of color. Like, I'll turn it over to you. How did you feel like you got over any internalized 
biases or racism that you had? I think it's an, it's, it's an ongoing conversation with myself and with my family members, with my community members, because that's where I can really start, right? Mm. When, when, we, when we're pointing out um, truths about ourselves. And, you know, uh, we use examples of individuals, but I think we, we also see, the, like, again, I come back to communities and how, for instance, a couple of years ago, the Chinese community, there were certain aspects of Chinese community in Markham staged an anti-immigrant rally. For me, which was, it was incredible. Like a lot of these people came through because of the immigration process we have in Canada because certain people believed that immigrants are, you know, they, and refugees are, 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 they need asylum and they need support. And then these very same people are now closing the doors behind them. So it's needing to kind of confront that kind of ideology, mm -hmm. which is toxic for me, which is selfish, which is very base. And I think, like, I always kind of, you know, uh, think about how you can't, you know, uh, lift, your, uh, lift yourself without lifting others. And the great quote that uh, the American civil rights uh, leader, Fannie Lou Hamer, said, nobody's free until everybody's free. Right? And I think that's how you kind of, that's one of the mantras that I think for me, uh, you know, uh, informs my work and my life here in Canada. I love yeah. it. I think we should end with that quote. Thank you both so much uh, for your insight, thank for you. your personal experiences, and for shining a light on this topic. Thanks again. Thank you. And thank you for watching Living in Color. Thank you for watching Living in Color. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have an idea for a future Living in Color episode, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave them in the comment section.